so I, I left off talking about adipose tissue. Um, and uh, the vast majority, uh, so first of all, adipose tissue is, is uh, categorized as a loose type of connective tissue. I, I said in terms of uh, connective tissue proper, stuff that's actually connecting things, right? Uh, there's going to be dense and there's going to be loose. And there were three types of dense. There was regular, irregular, and reticular. And then there's uh, a, a number of, of loose. There was areolar I talked about. Um, and... Uh, and now there's, this is adipose tissue. So um, the adipose tissue uh, is characterized, first of all, by these large vacuoles that are filled entirely with lipids. They're mostly storage molecules, or storage cells, right? Um, storing fat for energetic uses, for insulation, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, adipose tissue itself does also have an endocrine uh, function in itself. Uh, which we'll talk about a little bit in the GI chapter. Um, but in uh, all of us in the room at the moment, uh, any of the adipose tissue that we would find in our bodies is going to be of the uh, white fat variety. And it's called white fat because uh, that's what it looks like when you see it. Um, stores uh, energy, absorbs shock, uh, is, uh, acts as insulation. Um, and is found uh, throughout the body in different places. First of all, in the, uh, the most superficial layer of fascia in the body with a connective tissue uh, layer beneath uh, the dermis, in the, in the hypodermis. Um, and you can find it in other structures like, for example, the omentum, which is this uh, fatty skirt that hangs beneath the uh, rectus abdominis muscles. Uh, and covers the abdominal viscera, your omentum. This is how you can get those like, uh, like weightlifter people with like actual abs, but huge bellies still. And like, how does that work? It's they have a lot of fat in their omentum, uh, but you can still not a su superficial layer. Um, and then there's brown fat, uh, or so-called baby fat. Baby fat is indeed a real thing. Um, and it's called brown because uh, apparently it looks brown. I've never actually seen uh, uh, baby fat in C2. I, I injured myself once um, and got to see the fat and the fascia of my leg uh, up close. And it, it does look pretty shockingly white. Um, but uh, I've, never, I've never seen brown fat. But... Um, it is brown because it's more vascularized, um, and it has uh, a, a much richer meshwork of capillaries that invests it. And the adipocytes themselves are much more packed with uh, mitochondria as well. And um, all of this, the vascularization and the high density of mitochondria, uh, are... Uh, are the purpose of which is to help uh, the baby mobilize uh, energy rapidly. So um, what happens is when babies are born, they are little more than, than cute, squirming, squally uh, amoebas, right, that are little feeding machines that uh, drink as much milk as they can, and, and uh, adults all kind of go uh, gooey when they see the baby uh, squirming with the big chubby rolls on, on uh, his or her legs and arms. Um, all of that serves a, a purpose, however, because at a certain point, the baby makes this radical transition, it makes a radical transition from uh, being a, a, a squalling amoeba to a little creature that can stand up and begin to walk and uh, rapidly run around. So right at that period, there's an amazing explosion in uh, muscle growth and bone growth and, de and development of all sorts uh, in, in the infant. Um, it's, it's, it's pretty profound to watch, actually, how rapidly uh, this happens. It's hard to draw a parallel uh, to any other time in life, how rapidly a change in your uh, physical development um, occurs. And to 
please come on in. Good morning. Come on in. There's one right here. Um, and <clears throat> for the uh, baby to have the energy to do this, it needs to mobilize that uh, energy that's been stored in the brown fat quickly. It needs to mobilize that energy quickly. So uh, there's this period of, you know, maybe nine months, 10 months, something like that, where the baby is really just feeding uh, and feeding a little bit beyond its actual immediate caloric needs so that it can store up for this huge pulse of calories it's going to need when it begins to at like 10 or 12 months of age to be to pull itself up and then begin to run. Has anybody uh, watched this happen with like a cousin or a, a sibling or something? It's pretty it's pretty remarkable. And as that happens, uh, as the kids start to run, then then it's the cat's out of the bag. Uh, Pandora's box has been opened, and the children uh, good luck catching them. Um, so the the brown fat quickly melts away uh, from their from their body. Um, all right. Um, oh, wait a second. I, I feel like I had wanted to uh, hide this slide. I didn't really want to talk about this, but it's okay. We can talk about it. It's here. Uh, there are the su supportive connective tissues, bone and cartilage. We talked about bone. Uh, it supports weight. It is highly vascular, um, calcified, and it has this haversion system. We didn't go through the, the anatomy of the bone because this isn't an anatomy class, but uh, bone is highly vascular. Uh, it's an important point to make. Whereas the other type of uh, supportive connective tissue is cartilage. And rather than being uh, this um, ceramic, this calcified ceramic that's really hard, cartilage has this kind of, uh, I mean, anyone who's eaten meat of any sort is probably familiar with cartilage. It's kind of this rubbery, gel-like uh, substance and acts as a shock absorption and protection when bone meets bone, uh, etc. The thing about cartilage, however, is that it is avascular. It's avascular. There are no uh, blood vessels in it. So people say uh, dry as a bone, act, and that is actually a misnomer. It's a misnomer. Bones are not dry at all. They are quite bloody, in fact. Um, and uh, cartilage is not. So uh, given that, uh, which do you think would be uh, an easier injury to heal? Bone. You say bone. You sort of mouth it. Why? Okay. Uh, can't regenerate. So refine that a little bit. I, I don't actually agree exactly with that statement, but you're on the right path. <laughs> Why does it need blood? You can do it. It's 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 right there. Um, so how do how do cells get the um, the nutrients they need for repair via the blood, right? And um, it's much harder for the uh, the chondrocytes, the cartilage cells that are in what are called the lacuna. If you look, so here's a, a transect up. That looks like hyaline cartilage to me. Um, and uh, if you look at it, there's this gel matrix. That's the pink. And then there's these lacuna, these hollow spaces in the cartilage. And then there's the chondrocytes that live in there. For those cells to get the nutrients they need, um, the cartilage acts sort of like a sponge. It gets compressed and then it gets extended and compressed. And so there's this pumping action on the sponge, just like if you take a sponge underwater and, and squeeze it a few times, uh, it would suck the uh, fluid and nutrients into it. And then when you compress it, it's pushing uh, the uh, waste products, et cetera, out of, uh, of the tissue. So most of our cartilage gets a lot of that compression but uh, this is one of the reasons it's important to do things like yoga, for example. Not yoga is not the only way, but uh, putting gentle traction on your cartilage helps draw um, fluid into the avascular tissue uh, to, to help keep those chondrocytes healthy and maintain long-term soft tissue uh, health in your body. 
Um, yeah, so having a, a tear in your cartilage is much, much harder to heal than uh, a tear in uh, a break in your bone. Bones heal quite readily, actually. All right. All right, on to uh, this concept of tissue membranes. Now, I've covered epithelium. I've covered connective tissue types, very broad strokes over all of that. Um, I've introduced the concepts enough such that I can get to this important uh, idea here of a, what a tissue membrane is. This is not uh, a plasma membrane. This is not a cell membrane, a bilipid layer. It's nothing like that. Okay, these, this is a cellular membrane, a tissue membrane made of many, many, many cells and different cell types. So what is it? Uh, you'll have to cast your mind back to the haiku that I uh, spouted on the first day, which was, what was it, epithelium and connective tissue form the integument. I think that was my haiku. Um, it's well to remember for all of you. Uh, there are four types of, uh, first of all, I would say the definition is this little symbol here, ET over CT. Um, it's just uh, a tissue membrane is a layer of epithelial tissue over a layer of connective tissue, ET over CT. That's, uh, that's the definition of a tissue membrane. And there are four types of tissue membranes that you can find in the body, uh, four categories. The first is a mucous membrane. And mucous membranes uh, are found in various places in the body, uh, throughout the GI tract, in the nasal cavity, uh, the vagina, um, various places uh, that have these mucus-producing epithelial cells, these glandular epithelial cells, uh, laying on top of a layer of connective tissue. The next uh, type is serous membrane, and there are three kinds of serous membrane. I'm going to go through them. Uh, they ha serous membranes have a very uh, specific um, structure and function, and we'll, we'll cover them when we, in a moment. Uh, they're all found in the, what are called the ventral body cavities. Uh, then there are synovial membranes. Synovial membranes uh, essentially are found within joint capsules, all right, uh, within the joint capsule of your knees or fingers or wherever, uh, some sort of joint capsule uh, that has uh, synovial fluid um, within any kind of bursa. A bursa is, uh, uh, has a synovium on it. And then finally, the cutaneous membrane, your skin, the integument, uh, is, is the fourth tissue membrane that's found in the body. All right, so let's talk about mucosa. Um, <clears throat> Mucosa are going to line passageways that have external connections, all right? You may not think of your colon as having an external connection, but you can get there through the mouth or the rectum, the anus. Uh, your lungs, it lines the, uh, the respiratory system. Obviously, you can get there from the outside. Uh, the urinary system, the reproductive tracts, all of these surfaces uh, have mucosa. On them. Um, and one of the characteristics of a mucosa is that the, uh, they're going to have to have the epithelium uh, needs to remain moist. This is to reduce, uh, for a number of purposes, one of them is to reduce friction, uh, but also to facilitate absorption and, and excretion. So for example, in the nasal cavity, for you to be able to smell something, the odorant, the chemical, whatever the thing is that you're smelling needs to come into your nose and swirl around in the nasal cavity and then stick to uh, the nasal mucosa so that it can trigger a receptor. But for that to happen, the odorant has to be uh, drawn into solution, as it were. So there needs to be this layer, thin layer of fluid mucus uh, on the surface of the mucosa so that odorants can be dissolved and sensated. Um, the, epithe the epithelium lays on top of uh, a connective tissue layer uh, called the lamina propria, the proper layer, all right, the lamina propria. And it's uh, made of areolar tissue. It's just uh, areolar tissue. So a mucosal uh, membrane has areolar tissue as the CT, 
the ET is a mixture of um, uh, columnar epithelium and what are called goblet cells. So here are the ciliated uh, columnar epithelium, uh, simple uh, columnar epithelium. And then this is what's called a goblet cell. A goblet cell is uh, the cell that is going to release, the, produce and release the mucus out onto the surface. All right, And they call it a goblet cell because it looks like a goblet, I guess. Um, all right. That's all I'm going to say about muc mucous membranes right now. Uh, I'll talk about them a little bit more when we discuss the charming uh, mucociliary escalator in the, uh, in the lungs. All right. On to serous membranes. Now, serous membranes are um, important to understand uh, because there is a lot of, there's, there's a lot of clinical significance that uh, rotates around the various serous membranes. Um, so these are membranes that are going to line cavities that are not open to the outside world. You cannot uh, start on the skin and shrink yourself down uh, like Ant-Man or whatever and uh, walk yourself uh, onto a serous membrane. Um, they're very thin, of course, but uh, extremely strong. And their purpose is, so they're made, being thin, they're made of squamous, a layer of simple squamous epithelium that is laying on top of some areolar tissue. Uh, but they do produce uh, a cell, a cell, there's a cell product, and that's what's called a transudate, a fluid transudate. It's some sort of uh, serous fluid that uh, the cells create specifically to reduce friction. That is the primary purpose of the transudate, is to reduce friction, to be a low, to create a low friction surface. So, and we'll talk about why that is in a moment. Um, when you talk about a serous membrane, a serous membrane uh, is going to line a cavity that's not open to the outside, but it's also going to cover uh, an organ or a viscera of some sort um, that is going to move somehow. And, uh, and in moving, it's the job of the serous uh, membrane is to reduce the friction of that organ moving against the walls of the compartment that that organ is in. So, for example, the heart is beating, right? And it would be, uh, we would all have heartaches if our heart was constantly uh, creating friction across the media, in the mediastinum uh, where it lives. So the heart itself is coated in a serous membrane called the pericardium peri on top of cardium, car heart, right, the pericardium. And because any of these serous membranes are going to cover some organ and, and protect that organ from friction uh, as it moves in one way or the other with, uh, within this compartment that it's uh, located, there's going to be two distinct layers, two distinct, not, maybe not layers, regions of that serous membrane. And in general, those regions are called the parietal and the visceral layers. The visceral layer <laughs> is the layer that lays on top of the viscera, the actual organ. All right, so whatever organ it is, and I'll name the organs right now. There's the heart, there's the lungs, and there's the organs of the GI tract in the abdomen. All right, those are the three groups of viscera. Um, and all three of those are directly covered by a visceral uh, serous membrane. Now, the walls of the, um, the walls of the compartment are covered with what's called a parietal uh, serous membrane. So the heart lives uh, in the mediastinum in the chest and it's covered by a visceral pericardium. The specific serous membrane for the heart is called the pericardium. Um, and there, the other two serous membranes are pleura for the lungs and uh, peritoneum for the, uh, for the abdominal organs, the abdominal viscera. So in the heart, we have a visceral pericardium 
and then there's a parietal pericardium, and the two of them connect. You can kind of imagine the pericardium. So I have this picture here of a sort of uh, saggy balloon, a, a partially deflated balloon, and imagine sticking your uh, your fist as if your fist was a heart because your heart is about the size of your clenched fist, um, sticking uh, your fist into that balloon. The part of the balloon that's touching your hand would be the visceral pericardium, and then the outside of the balloon that's not actually touching your hand, that would be the parietal pericardium. But it's all one uh, contiguous uh, membrane. Does that make sense? And the space in between, uh, inside the balloon, would be the pericardial cavity, and that's where you would find the transudate, all right? So that when the heart beats, it's able to uh, have a very low friction against the, the compartment that it finds itself in, all right? Now, when uh, the people who uh, you can be in congestive heart failure and uh, you can be producing too much, you can have electrolyte problems or whatever, there's a, there's a heart condition where your pericardium can become too full of uh, transudate and there's too much fluid on the heart and it's preventing the heart from even uh, contracting properly and getting perfused with uh, fluid and it's preventing the heart from actually uh, beating as efficiently as possible. All right, so um, visceral layer, parietal layer. Uh, to help you understand the word parietal, I tell this story sometimes, I don't know if it helps. I went to Notre Dame uh, for graduate school, and the undergrads there, I mean, you guys have co-ed dorms, so it may seem strange to you, but there they separate the genders, and um, you have to, the, the boys have to be out of the girls' dorm, and the girls have to be out of the boys' dorm at 10 o'clock. They call that parietals there, um, and parietal meaning wall, uh, like you know, parent, your parents' Uh, can form a, a wall around you, a protective wall around you. Uh, parietal uh, is the same word origin, just means wall. So parietal is, is refers to the wall of uh, the compartment that the organ finds itself in. Yes? Cool? All right. Uh, so here they are. Here's the three. I've mentioned them already, or one of them. I guess all of them. The first is the pleura, and the pleura... Uh, covers the lungs. There's going to be a parietal pleura that lays right on, uh, no, I'm sorry, the parietal pleura lines the cavity uh, that the lungs find themselves in, and then the visceral pleura uh, is adhered directly to the lungs. Um, does anyone know what, uh, so I used to read like Charles Dickens books when I was a kid. I kind of enjoyed that for some reason. I like sort of Victorian era writing. And stories about these uh, people going to the seashore, these like old, old people uh, go to the seashore and, and drink anise tea to try to, to cure their inflammation of the lung. What, what, does anyone remember what that term is? <coughs> You've heard of pleurisy before? Pleurisy? Well, it's just an inflammation of the pleura um, that seemed to affect... Victorian era people quite a bit, I guess, bad, bad air. I don't know. Um, then there's the peritoneum. And the peritoneum is, um, can be a little bit hard to conceive of because it's covering such a complex array of organs. Uh, the peritoneum is in the abdominal cavity. It's covering all the abdominal viscera, um, except with one notable exception, uh, which is the kidney, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But um, all of all of the uh, coils of your uh, intestines, the stomach, all of the abdominal uh, contents are coated in a visceral peritoneum. Then the walls of the abdomen, the abdominal walls, the front and back wall of your abdomen, are lined with a parietal peritoneum. Um, if a person is in acute uh, kidney failure, right? Uh, you, can, you can put them on dialysis, right? Uh, 
Or you can do something called, uh, if you're in the hospital, it's a real emergency, you can do something called peritoneal lavage. Um, and that means they, they uh, puncture the wall of your abdomen uh, and go inside uh, the peritoneal cavity. So they've gone inside the parietal peritoneum, but not into the actual lumen of the intestines or anything like that, right? <clears throat> it's just in the abdominal cavity. And then they fill your abdomen with a uh, hypotonic solution, a hypotonic solution, so that um, all of the waste products in your blood that your kidneys should be filtering out are just uh, are just osmos or diffuse, I guess is the right word, uh, diffuse across the um, <coughs> across the uh, visceral peritoneum into this hypotonic solution. Then you just suck it out of the abdomen, and it's, it's not it's pretty crude, but it it does uh, work in an emergency. You can't live like that forever, but uh, it's one way of <coughs> of achieving. Uh, uh, some uh, kidney function. Uh, all right. And then uh, we talked about the pericardium, which has a visceral and parietal layer as well. Uh, the one thing about the kidneys, I, I had mentioned them, uh, kidneys are actually not covered in visceral peritoneum. They are tacked to the back wall of the abdomen by a, a thin layer of parietal peritoneum. Just a, just a little... A little bit of the kidney is covered uh, by some parietal peritoneum that kind of pins it to the back wall. So it's what's called a retroperitoneal organ. Uh, maybe tuck that one away in for uh, some point future in your career. Um, all right. And then finally, the synovial membranes. Now, synovium is, um, produces the synovial fluid. And it, it's going to line joint cavities in articulated and moving joints. Um, this fluid that's in there, the synovial fluid, uh, enables that joint to have minimal uh, contact between the bones. I mean, that's what you want. You want a joint to be able to support weight with having uh, one bone have minimal impact on the other bone. So we have cartilage there. We see that. Uh, we, we see the synovial fluid, this sort of like fluid-filled uh, joint. Um, the synovium, uh, the synovial fluid is also, um, it kind of acts like the, uh, the nourishing broth for the chondrocytes as well, because as cartilage gets compressed uh, and then it, it expands, uh, that pumping action uh, can uh, draw uh, synovium, synovial fluid into uh, the into the tissue of the cartilage, hydrate the, the cartilage. Um, the epithelial layer of a synovial membrane actually is um, not complete. It's not a full uh, layer, so that the cellularity or junctionality uh, of the epithelium breaks down a little bit. Uh, I don't think I need to say anything more about this. This is This is just sort of a footnote. And then finally is the cutaneous membrane. Um, and that is your skin. It covers uh, the entire body. It's thick, waterproof, and dry, right? Um, so what does it look like? Well, the uh, epithelial layer uh, is what we call the epidermis. And then the connective tissue layer is what we call the dermis. And there are several layers within each of those, uh, two layers actually only in the dermis, but there are several layers in the epidermis, uh, in the epithelial layer. Um, yeah, so the epithelium itself is a form of uh, stratified squamous epithelium, uh, whereas the connective tissue layer, uh, the one that forms the basement membrane for the epithelium is made of areolar tissue, uh, but that areolar tissue sits on top of a deeper layer of dense, irregular connective tissue. So uh, we'll, we're going to go through that in a little bit of detail uh, now. All right. So here is uh, an outline of the skin and, and subcutaneous tissue. I should probably um, 
revise this because this is what I used to talk about and I've, I've cut it back as I've added more important material elsewhere uh, over the years. Uh, so here I'm probably just mostly going to talk about uh, the red box. I'm not going to talk about the green box about hair or nails at all any longer. And I've also cut out the pathology, uh, the skin cancer and the burns. I will talk a little bit about uh, one interesting uh, disease at the end of class. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I'm probably not going to talk about much in terms of the cutaneous glands, although I think I will talk a little bit about the uh, sweat glands. Mostly I'm just going to talk about the epidermis and the dermis here. All right. Um, oh, and I have put a, um, an edited back version of this PDF on just this morning. I don't know if anybody had downloaded these slides uh, a while ago, but there should be an, or no, no, no. I did the next slide show today. This one has been there for a while. An edited version should be there. Have been there for a while. All right, so the integument. <clears throat> it's about 15% of the mass of your body. That's a significant amount of who you are. Um, it is uh, <clears throat> about two square meters in area. Um, despite that, it's only a couple millimeters thick. That's uh, incredibly thin, right? That's about um, sort of the thickness of your uh, thumbnail, maybe. <clears throat> it's made of uh, the cutaneous membrane, which has the epithelium on top of the connective tissue. Uh, that's the epidermis and the dermis. And then there are various accessory structures that make up uh, the skin, um, such as uh, the sebaceous glands, the hair, etc., sweat glands. All right. In terms of the types of skin on your body, there's actually uh, only two. There's only two types. There's thick skin and thin skin. Now, um, thick skin and thin skin, uh, the, the biggest distinction is not their actual thickness. It's uh, that thick skin has no hair in it. And there are, there's an extra layer of keratinocytes when we're going through the layers of the epidermis, there's an extra layer uh, of um, skin cells in the epidermis, uh, but there are no hair uh, follicles. Whereas in thin skin, there is uh, only four layers of keratinocytes, uh, but uh, there is a layer, uh, there, there is the presence of hair follicles. Um, so, for example, the skin on uh, the external genitalia. Uh, the bottoms of the feet and the hands, I mean, this baby's, uh, the bottom of their, this baby's feet, that skin is actually quite thin in a baby, right? But that's thick skin, whereas uh, the skin on, on this dude's back here um, is, um, that would be considered thin skin, right? Because that's, uh, there's obviously hair coming out of that skin. All right. So what does uh, skin do? Yeah, I made this slide before this guy was president. Um, but who knew? Um, so what does it do? Um, it gives us uh, hot and cold protection. Uh, it gives us protection from UV radiation, uh, acts as a water barrier, uh, protects us from mechanical stress, uh, and chemical stress. Uh, we do uh, absorb some things through the skin. It acts as a barrier to various pathogens. Uh, there are um, a high density of immune cells, in, white blood cells in the skin that helps uh, destroy any pathogen, pathogens that may make it through. Um, yeah, helps with thermal regulation in terms of uh, radiating heat off and the, and the uh, vasoconstriction or dilation of the capillaries. Uh, we get a lot of sensation from the skin. Uh, there's uh, a high density of, of sensory receptors there. We also get um, our vitamin D. We've already talked about that. Uh, mo most of our vitamin D comes through the skin. And then, of course, uh, facial expressions. The skin of our face is able to uh, convey emotion, right? There's a tremendous amount about uh, our external appearance that 
as involved in, in communication, either, uh, showing being a thinker or someone who is um, upset about something, maybe. All right, the epidermis. Um, <clears throat> it's avascular uh, stratified squamous epithelium. And the cells of the epidermis get their nutrients and oxygen uh, to diffuse through capillaries that are in the dermis from below. So I, I've, we've said that epidermis or epithelial cells are avascular, right? No blood uh, vessels get up into uh, an epithelial layer. So all of the all of the metabolic requirements of your epidermis, those epithelial cells, comes from below, comes from the dermis below. Um, this photo on the right-hand side is a still from a movie. Um, what was it called? It's a James Bond movie. Uh, Goldfinger, right, where James Bond, Sean Connery there, is, um, is fighting a bad guy named Goldfinger who kills people by dipping them in gold. Uh, it's kind of weird, but um, the thing is, and so the thought was that if you dip the person in gold, that uh, they cannot, they will suffocate because they can't get enough oxygen through their skin uh, to breathe. And um, in, in fact, that is, that is wrong. That is completely wrong. That is not, um, that is always kind of, even as a, as a child when I saw that movie, I was like, really? No. Not really. Uh, but back then, they, they believed it so much so that this actress that they painted in gold paint, um, apparently, she's wearing uh, her, her bikini bottom there. Um, underneath that, there is no gold paint because they were worried that she would suffocate to death uh, in the film. Uh, that, that turned out, of course, to be a, a poor understanding. They just needed to talk to a physiologist to say, can't you come up with a better plot? I don't know. Um, okay, let's uh, let's look at the skin in a little more detail now. So um, this diagram that I have here is of thick skin. If you wanted to get a diagram of thin skin, it would be exactly the same, except this dark purple layer that you see up here, uh, the stratum lucid, uh, no, no, I'm sorry, the stratum, yes, no, I'm sorry, the stratum lucidum, not the, not the purple one, the, the lighter one above the purple, but uh, below the very outermost layer, the stratum lucidum, uh, lucid meaning clear. Um, the stratum lucidum is not present in thin skin. All the others, stratum corneum, granulosum, spinosum, and basali are. So uh, walking through them, the stratum basale uh, that you see down there, also known sometimes as the stratum germinativum, you'll also see that term, uh, stratum basale or germinativum. This is the germative layer. These are uh, the cells that are mitotic. They're still uh, mitotic at, at this point, meaning they can divide and, and propagate. And as they do so, they push the cell layers up towards the surface, right? There's this constant sort of um, conveyor belt of cells moving from the stratum basale up towards the stratum uh, corneum. Then uh, you move to the stratum uh, spinosum, so-called because the cells begin to look a little bit spiny, a little bit spiny. These are all these cells uh, that are keratinocytes. It's a type of epithelial cell. Uh, and they're called that because their cellular product is keratin. One of their cellular products is keratin. Um, and keratin is a, it's the thing that uh, makes your, your nails and your, your skin the way uh, they are. Uh, the, the keratin protein makes these, uh, the cells in the stratum spinosum kind of spiny looking, a little bit pointy, pokey uh, looking. And then as they move upward, we get to the stratum granulosum, the cells. At this point, when they get to stratum granulosum, they are uh, what's called quiescent or essentially uh, metabolically inactive. 
uh, they, they begin to die. Uh, the stratum basale and spinosum are still uh, reasonably, uh, well, the stratum basale are, are totally metabolically active, but they begin to uh, dial it back uh, in the stratum spinosum. Then stratum granulosum, they fill with, uh, they fill with all these granules and they became, become quiescent. And then uh, as they move into the upper layers, they essentially dehydrate and um, and uh, yeah, desiccate and form this cellular uh, layer of, of fully dead uh, keratinocytes <clears throat> that uh, pack down and form a, a barrier, hopefully impermeable barrier on this on the surface of the skin. Um, when we look at the uh, the cast of other characters uh, here, we have. Uh, the important ones, I guess, are the tactile cells and the melanocytes. Um, melanocytes are the cells that have melanin in it. We've talked about them in the uh, last time, I believe. Um, they produce the pigment, pigment melanin that helps protect uh, the more delicate uh, underlying surfaces from the deleterious effects of UV radiation. Um, And then, yeah, um, the tactile cells. So here, here's a, uh, a picture of a specialized epithelial cell that's in contact with a tactile nerve fiber. There's going to be a, a couple different uh, arrangements of that that we'll see when we get to the sensory chapter. Um, I don't think I have anything else to a point to make here. So... This is a lot of details that I don't, I don't feel particularly compelled to go through. Um, what point do I want to make? I guess the point here, the, the biggest point, is that it takes about uh, a month for a cell to go from the stratum, uh, bizarrely or, or germinativum, up uh, to the point where it's become dead and desiccated and, and flakes off as a skin flake. All right. Um, takes about a month, in 30 to 40 days. So a cell that originally uh, was birthed by the uh, mitosis, the, the division of a stem cell at the base of the epidermis, uh, will, will live for about a month uh, before it, uh, it flakes off. And so the, the consequence of this is if you have uh, completely ab abraded the surface of your uh, epithelium, like completely abraded a large portion of it, it will take um, a, at least a month for that to fully fill in and uh, be as if the uh, epidermis had not been abraded at all. All right, so now this story. <clears throat> Before I get into this, are there any questions about that? Any, anything I talked about? Um, so my, you know, students like to hear stories about pathology, and so I, I give them stories about uh, pathology when I can. Um, and in the skin unit, um, I had, as a younger person, uh, suffered from uh, atopic dermatitis, which is just, um, it's like a form of eczema, like an allergic eczema. And I had it pretty severely. severely. Uh, it's what drove me to study uh, immunology for my master's degree at University of Virginia. And, um, and while there, I uh, learned about this camp called the, um, run by the American Academy of Dermatology. I went there uh, and volunteered at this camp uh, for children with chronic skin disease of different sorts. And I had never heard about RDEB. Had anyone, has anyone else heard of epidermolysis bullosa before? Um, but I, I encountered this disease there. And uh, what happens in these people is they have some sort of uh, missense mutation in the gene that encodes uh, for type 7 collagen. It's, you have several different types of collagen that your body makes depending upon the tissue that it's found in. And um, in these people, there's some sort of problem with their collagen 7 where it doesn't get expressed properly. And what happens is um, when, this, when a person with this uh, disease 
gets a little bit of shear force on their skin. Uh, you know, like just the kind of thing that you would do every day holding somebody's hand or anything like that. Um, the, the shear force, uh, because there's no collagen there, uh, to, to add strength to the areolar tissue. Their areolar, areolar tissue does not uh, have the same resilience that um, a typical person's might have. Because of that, the, the layer of uh, the papillary layer and the reticular layer of the dermis separate from one another and form a blister uh, the way uh, you may form a blister when you're doing some kind of repetitive action, right? And you... And you through excessive mechanical force separate those layers, uh, they require very much less. And in fact, the problem here is that the fluid pressure, when you get a blister, it feels tight, right? The fluid pressure of the blister in these people causes the blister, uh, the margins of the blister to enlarge. So 70, 80 percent of their body at any one given time can be coated in a blister or be healing from a blister. A small, you know, focal point can grow to a, to a large portion of their body. Rapidly, these people uh, live truly mind-bending existences. Um, yeah, so for example, it's not just in, on the surface; uh, it happens throughout their GI tract. So they uh, have to be on liquid diets their whole life, and because they're on liquid diets, they never take uh, uh, solid, solid bowel movements and they lose muscle tonus in their rectum because of that, and so they have to wear diapers, um, and they can't, they can't control their bowels properly. Uh, obviously, their teeth don't form well. They get this uh, mitten, uh, th this mittening, which is because the scar tissue in their hands has happened so much that their fingers get scarred over. Um, they can move their fingers, like this child here would be able to, you'd be able to see the fingers moving in there, but there's but they've been all scarred together the way you see that. Uh, they get corneal abrasions exceptionally easily. Uh, their teeth don't uh, form very well. Uh, pretty horrifying disease. They, uh, many of them become addicted to morphine because they're in such chronic pain. They're highly prone to skin cancer uh, and an early death. Uh, so the camp, while I was there, I was helping this one young man named Justin Cross uh, change his bandages. They, they're, obviously, their bodies are coated healing constantly, and their bodies are um, wrapped in bandages. And uh, you have to change them on a daily basis. And I was, I was doing a bandage change for him, and you sit, and you have to soak them in the bathtub for an hour or so to, to loosen all of the uh, bandages off the tissue. and um, and he was wincing. He was in pain. And I was, I was, to be frank, kind of scared shitless. Um, you know, dealing with this, I don't know, maybe nine-year-old, ten-year-old boy, beautiful blue eyes. And, uh, and he, I was being very ginger and kind of, uh, you know, he could tell that I was nervous. It was the first time I had done this uh, for him. And he stops me and he says, Tom... You know, I want you to know that I know that this is going to hurt. I'm not afraid of it. Um, I'm not afraid. I don't want you to be afraid either. I want you to <clears throat> just be able to do your job and and um, and 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 not not be afraid because I'm 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 not either. And it was. It was such a profound moment for me. It was such a profound moment uh, and made me, in that moment, understand um, some kind of meaning in what seems like such a, a meaningless thing on, on, on our, in our world. Uh, the, like The suffering that these, these people go through can seem to confound our ability to make sense of our existence, right? But... I, I understood in that moment the power of um, the kind of message that, that can come from these people and the things that uh, sort of they alone can, can show um, all of us and, and make all of us stronger uh, by. It, it, was, it was an important moment in my life. Uh, and, you know, 
you don't have to go and, and find a person with recessive dystrophic epidermal lysis bullosa to come to those insights yourself, right? But um, uh, there are those people, not all of them are like Justin Cross. Not all of them have that ability to find that, that inner strength, um, but it is, it is there in them. It is there in them um, for, for them to find and then to share. And I was, I was lucky uh, to have him share that. It, the story gets bizarre afterwards. So I finished the, the, the person's uh, bandage change and I go outside and it had been raining and all the kids had been in the dining hall, uh, you know, singing songs to some guy and a piece of guitar. And I was just sitting overlooking the bluff over the lake and, and this amazing, like genuinely double rainbow arch comes up and I was like, Whoa, this is magical. And then the whole, the whole camp comes out like to where I was and starts singing rainbow connection. I was like, oh man, <laughs> this is, this is, this is something. Something else. Um, yeah, this woman here was the, I'll, I'll let you out. I know I'm a moment over, but um, this is my last slide. Uh, this woman's name was Jamie Hartley. Uh, she was the oldest living person with recessive dystrophic epidermal lysis bullosa. Uh, when I first she used to show this slide about her, she's a Mormon woman that had a really gorgeous, gorgeous voice uh, and had excellent care by her husband and family. Um, she has since passed away. But these people can be uh, highly functioning, highly functioning individuals as well, beyond just having a powerful message. Um, they, they can, can reach uh, high potential. Thank you very much for listening to me. Have a beautiful day. Have a beautiful day. Can I do anything for anybody? Any questions?